Hi, my name is Dave Jantz. I'm a Special Housing Operations Captain at Snake River Correctional Institution, and we have developed a resource team at our facility. We're a group of staff that share the same goals and values of injecting humanity into the prison population. Our target is to change prison culture and get away from the us versus them mentality. We work with AICs that have been in long-term restrictive housing, as well as any AIC in crisis. One of the tools we utilize is empathy in a situation to gain compliance in place of verbal orders, taking a moment to invest in a conversation for a more desired outcome for all. Okay, what I have here is a PowerPoint presentation uh, based upon uh, an AIC that we're working at that we'll call case number seven at Snake River Correctional Institution, uh, revolving around humanization and normalization in the Oregon way. What does the resource team do and how is it different than a response team? The primary goal of the resource team is to weigh and measure a situation and de-escalate it through conversation. Slowing down to have a conversation and attempt to help the AIC through crisis and approach it at the appropriate level of response on a scale of one to 10. If the AIC is acting out or in crisis at a four, we have been trained to approach it at a 10. This is what we call gasoline. Is it possible to meet the AIC at a four as well? Mindfulness of body language, tone, positioning, and if possible, taking the extra minute to listen. This is water to the situation. Approaching the situation at a 10 would likely drive the AIC in crisis to a 10 as well. This raises the percentage of reactive force, staff injury, future litigation, or AIC injury. The resource team will never take the place of a response team. If a response team is called, this means the ability to weigh and measure the situation does not present itself, and for the safety, security, and orderly operation of the facility, it must be resolved immediately. So in the beginning, uh, this is a little bit of history on where we started and, and how we got to where we're at today. Uh, it started by attending the Norway to Oregon training uh, at the penitentiary in March of 2019. Uh, we all went into it very skeptical as we believed nothing was broken. I was participating in this scenario when I was told to stop and asked why I would respond the way that I did. Moment of clarity when my answer was, it was the way I was trained. And I, I made that, that comment uh, with a lot of confidence. And, and that's, when, that's when everything hit me like a freight train. So we conducted an eight hour training at SRCI with our Norwegian friends, then developed a structure for a resource team. Uh, our case number one was the first AIC we worked with. He had 18 and a half years of restrictive housing. Only six months of his last 19 years had been in general population, uh, but that wasn't consecutively. Several one to do placements in GP, uh, ultimately ending back into restrictive housing. Five AICs with a total of 80 and a half years of restriction, uh, restrictive housing are now dissolved and transitioned into general population. And this started to get the attention of our facility. Folks are starting to realize the vast majority of AICs have an outdate. Whether that's general population or parole, we must introduce normality, humanity prior to release. This raises the percentage of running a safer facility, reducing staff and AIC injuries and preventing future litigation. We are looking at expanding resource teams into general population to assist with restrictive housing transitions, and this will also give our OIC the ability to dispatch the team to respond to AICs in crisis. Uh, this is uh, a couple photographs of AIC case number one story. Uh, so this guy spent about 18 years in ASU. Uh, way back when he provided information, uh, cooperated with an investigation. Uh, until recently, he believed he was a marked man, uh, has mentally deteriorated during this time, uh, a lot of history of suicide attempts, over 50 major misconduct reports during this incarceration cycle, while in restrictive housing. Uh, 
The picture where he's in the jumpsuit was pretty impactful. Uh, that was our very first unrestrained walk that we did. Uh, and we're doing this during count, so our facility is completely locked down. And you can see the gun tower in the back. Uh, and the tower was not manned by anyone. Um, when we got back to the conference room for a debrief, uh, we started talking to case number one. And while we were on the walk, he was walking really close to me. And, and so that needed to be addressed. And I asked him, hey, why, why were you walking so close to me? Multiple times I had to redirect him a, a few steps off to the side. And that's where he broke down in tears. Uh, he believed that because of all the bad things that he had done, we were taking him out there to execute him uh, when he saw the gun tower. So he stayed really close to me because he didn't think the tower officer would risk taking a shot at him and risk, risk hitting me. Uh, this really opened our eyes to the how complex these cases are and also the, the deterioration of the mind, body, and the soul and the effects of long-term restrictive housing. Uh, after working with him for several months, uh, the next picture was his transition into a general population unit. Our current uh, AIC case number seven, uh, he had an uh, admission date in 2002 to be released in 2007, serving 70 months for robbery. After convicted of 19 felonies since admission, he's added 47 and a half years, uh, 17,319 days, and his current parole date is 1-6 of 2055. Little bit of history on case number seven, disciplinary fines, uh, 24,000, property damage, 4,000, Restitution and fines, almost 8,348 recorded misconduct reports. Uh, 21 had the element of staff assault. Two had the element of uh, possession of weapon. And three had the element of escape. 19 felonies committed. Unusual incident reports. Uh, the reason why that starts at 2010 is that's when the OMS started recording them. So there was probably a pile of them prior to that, but 55 in total, 11 involving weapons, six involving exposing staff to bodily fluids, 29 involving property damage, 10 staff assaults, uh, and eight uh, use of force, four planned and four reactive. So this guy's had 20 years of restrictive housing, entering special housing one month after admission. Uh, these three photos here capture uh, some of the damage uh, that case number seven uh, has done. Uh, you can see the in the first picture, the, the, the cell window is destroyed. Uh, the middle picture, uh, that's actually a still uh, sitting stool that he continued to kick and kick and kick until it got warm and started to bend and he was actually to break it off from the mount and the last picture is a metal electrical box that he managed to destroy this next slide shows uh, one of the bathrooms that we utilize outside of our intake center uh, and he needed to use the restroom and he goes in there and in a matter of minutes, uh, he pretty much destroyed the whole the whole area. Uh, this this slide here captures holding room number four. Uh, holding room number four was actually designed and built for case number seven. Uh, very heel st uh, heavy steel door that's uh, connected to a roller on the bottom so that a uh, staff member is able to open it and close it uh, because the weight of the door. Uh, if you look at the, the third picture, uh, the little vents in the top uh, with angled iron to where if any fluid is thrown from the inside out, uh, it can't come over the top and it actually drops right back down inside. 
So the resource team prior to each activity, uh, we meet with case number seven. The conversation uh, with him determines on how the resource team will measure the risk of the activity. So prior to this conversation, there's a very extensive uh, risk assessment and pre-planning done. This conversation usually lasts uh, around 20 minutes, but essentially this is, this is the team checking case number seven's temperature on whether or not we, we're, we're going to safely continue uh, with whatever the activity is. There's five photos on this slide. Uh, this is where we first started uh, kind of introducing the, the humanity and normalization, trying to have normal conversations with them, uh, trying to build rapport with them. Uh, you can see in these photos that he still has uh, belly, belly chains and leg irons on. Uh, the way that we pre-plan for these activities is you'll see officers in the hallway. Everybody has a position. Everybody has a role uh, to where we can we can react to uh, any negative interaction, uh, and that's in our risk assessment. Also, uh, the worst case scenario would would, would be staff assault. Uh, so then we try to figure out what what could trigger that. If it does happen. Uh, what barriers can we put up to reduce the consequences if it does happen? So we we continue to to train quite a bit for for those situations. So after one of our pre pre planning and risk assessments, uh, we went to the point of reducing restraints with case number seven. Uh, so right here, he has belly chains on, uh, no leg irons. Uh, so after each activity, the resource team, uh, we evaluate each other and, and the way that. The way that we used our tone, body positioning, uh, trying to inject that dynamic security into the situation. Uh, you can see in the first picture, I'm kind of standing to the side instead of a bladed stance in front of them. So I want to be aware of, of my body language, uh, because he's going to read that, so we don't. We just do what we can to to make it to where he doesn't feel threatened. The other AIC off to the right of case number seven. He's one of our mentors. Uh, we thought the importance of bringing a mentor onto this uh, program and and with the team is as a peer. There's so many areas within the prison that the lights off. The lights are off for for custody staff. And so the mentor can reach areas that uh, we can't. And this this particular mentor shares the same goals and values that uh, the entire team has. 